Good morning, everybody, and thank you for joining us today on this discussion of anti-Asian racism in the era of great power competition. Uh, my name is Manjari Mahajan. I'm Associate Professor for International Affairs and Co-Director of the India-China Institute at the New School University in New York. I will be the moderator of today's event. Um, since the advent of the COVID-19 pandemic in late December 2019, racist attacks, harassment, and hate speech towards people of Asian descent have drastically increased in the United States and in many other parts of the world. This event has been convened to continue ongoing conversations on how to understand these racist attacks, how to contextualize them, and how to respond to them, especially in a university setting which values the free and frank exchange of ideas. For today's conversation, we are very fortunate to have with us as our main speaker, Ms. Jessica Lee. Um, Jessica Lee is a senior research fellow in the East Asia program at the Quincy Institute for Responsible Statecraft. Her research interests include US foreign policy toward the Indo-Pacific region with an emphasis on alliances and North Korea. Jessica's analysis and writings have been widely featured in the popular media, including in the Wall Street Journal, Washington Post, Foreign Affairs, Foreign Policy, and many more places. Uh, she is also a non-resident senior associate fellow at the Asia Pacific Leadership Network. She is a term member of the Council on Foreign Relations, a member of the National Committee on North Korea, a 21-22 Arms Control Negotiation Academy fellow, and a member of the National Committee on American Foreign Policy 2020 US-Japan Republic of Korea Emerging Leaders Working Group. So we are very happy to have you with us today, Jessica. Uh, but we are also additionally fortunate to have as our discussant today, Professor Ying Chen. Ying Chen is Assistant Professor of Economics at the New School. She holds a PhD in economics from University of Massachusetts Amherst. Her work mainly explores the contradictions within capitalism and how they exhibit themselves. Um, some of the topics she has studied include economic development, labor, and climate change, and she has a special focus on countries in the global south. Um, she has published extensively in journals, including the Environment and Development Economics Journal, Economics and Labor Relations Review, and more. So we feel very lucky to have Jessica and Ying today with us. Um, I will soon turn over the floor to Jessica, but before I turn it over, um, just a quick note to the audience um, that we will be taking questions at the end after both speakers have finished speaking. Uh, please type in your questions in the Q&A box. The chat forum is going to be unavailable to the audience, but the Q&A box is where you should post your questions. Uh, so without further ado, Jessica, the floor is yours. Well, thank you so much. Um, I hope you can hear me okay. And it's such a pleasure to be with you this morning. Um, I want to begin uh, with a note of thanks to Professor uh, Andre Mahajan for her warm welcome, uh, Professor Ying Chen, uh, whose uh, comments I'm looking forward to, uh, Professor Frazier, of course, Grace Howe, and the India uh, China Institute at the New School for inviting me to speak on this important topic today. My only regret. Uh, is that this is not in person <laughs> and so i very much look forward to uh, meeting all of these uh, distinguished scholars uh, and experts uh, at the new school another time uh, when our public health conditions allow it i'll start with a brief overview of the quincy institute for responsible statecraft and uh, explain how i got involved uh, in this issue uh, which is at really at the nexus of anti-asian violence and civil liberties uh, and american foreign policy i'll end uh, with some recommendations for policymakers and the general public uh, as folks contemplate uh, ways that they can become more involved in, in the solutions to this challenge of anti-Asian racism. So as was mentioned, I work at the Quincy Institute, which is a foreign policy think tank based here in Washington, DC. We were founded in December, 2019. Uh, and we our, our mission and our vision is really to promote ideas that will move uh, American foreign policy uh, toward peace, uh, and where peace is the norm uh, and war is the exception. We aim to be nonpartisan in our goals and policies, intellectual arguments, and outreach strategies. 
uh, and they are not driven by party interests. At the same time, our theory of change is that we must be transpartisan. Um, you know, in, the, in, in convincing policymakers, politicians, activists, and consumers all across political parties on both the left and the right to work with us in order to achieve our foundational goals uh, and, and sort of the policies that we think will advance uh, toward uh, these uh, end goals that I mentioned up front. Some uh, Washington-based foreign policy think tanks claim to be nonpartisan in the way uh, in that they are not run by people from either major political party, but you know they do have um, you know I think uh, some vested interest in maintaining the status quo um, uh, in Washington, uh, in part because it is uh, so well funded uh, and well coordinated, uh, including by those in the defense industry. Uh, others, you know, that claim to be sort of nonpartisan, uh, but were built by partisans and you know serve primarily as a holding tank uh, where, when their party is out of power uh, and an administration feeder when their party is in power is another sort of typical uh, form, uh, uh, form uh, of, of uh, think tank kind of arrangement that is uh, usually found here. So I think at the, the Quincy Institute, what we're trying to do is create a new bench of foreign policy thinkers and writers uh, who believe that the US would be better served by putting more emphasis on our core national interests uh, and, and an emphasis on cooperation and diplomacy uh, rather than mil military dominance. And we want to uh, be a resource to congressional offices, White Houses, and candidates and civic leaders, anyone uh, who support these goals. Uh, we do not accept funding from foreign governments or defense companies in order to be able to challenge anyone who opposes our principles and goals, as, um, as I mentioned before, uh, which sets us apart from many uh, think tanks in Washington where uh, the lines tend to be a little bit blurrier and folks tend to be uh, less willing to criticize uh, US government. So I'll offer a bit of personal context on how I arrived uh, on this issue of anti-Asian racism. Uh, I myself was born in South Korea uh, and grew up in New York City. And I've been working in US government and nonprofits in Washington for the past 13 years or so, including uh, for four years as a community organizer for Korean Americans, uh, where I really learned the value of civic engagement. My first job out of graduate school was as a foreign policy advisor in the House of Representatives, where I worked for six years. And it was there that I saw firsthand, you know, this power of, of constituents and grassroots movements in changing national policies and foreign policy even those that seem impossible at the time, whether it's the Obama administration's normalization of relations with Cuba and Myanmar uh, or the Iran nuclear deal. Many of these policy changes took place due to active civic engagement by voters and civic groups. So when I joined the Quincy Institute in November 2019, I uh, honestly uh, didn't really know uh, how much I would come to rely on this background uh, of, in Congress, uh, as well as in community organizing. Uh, specifically, I had no idea that um, a few months later we would be hit with a pandemic uh, and that we would start to see uh, disturbing uh, events uh, and hate incidents uh, occurring throughout the countries, uh, country. Um, in short, the experience uh, of, of, of being, you know, uh, in the Asian American community uh, really provide, uh, provided me with essential kind of understanding and context uh, that I think uh, has helped me to discern what is happening and what our community needs to do to really push back more effectively. So in the early days of the pandemic, um, you might recall that President Trump <clears throat> frequently used terms such as China virus and Kung flu uh, to describe the COVID-19 um, in ways that frankly was very unnecessary uh, and incendiary. In a photo that went viral last March, uh, former President Trump's speech notes showed that he crossed out the word Corona and replaced it with Chinese. And given the magnitude of the public health crisis, and the fear that had gripped this country and the number of lives that have since been lost, this is essentially you know, akin to throwing gasoline into fire. And I think former President Trump and his defenders um, you know, defended his use of such terms, uh, saying that he was actually just trying to be accurate about the virus's origin, um, that he's not racist. <laughs> this is not meant as a hate against uh, you know, Asian uh, people. <clears throat> 
Uh, but he and his advisors must know that the World Health Organization and CDC uh, had warned against naming diseases after certain populations as far back as 2015 due to the stigma that such practice would generate. So whatever the reason for this extreme uh, racialized language uh, during the Trump era, the outcome was anger, xenophobia, and hate against Chinese people and indirectly all East Asians who could pass for Chinese like me. <laughs> and this unfortunately has continued to this day. Indeed, the word Chinese denotes more than a country. It also describes a culture, language, and in the case of American history, a form of othering, whether you are a fifth generation Asian American or a more recent immigrant. So last May, I wrote uh, my first article on this subject uh, in Responsible Statecraft, where I pointed out the connections between a racialized language on COVID and national security, which affects, which is something that obviously affects all Americans. You don't have to be Asian American to be worried about what's happening. At a time when we need more people who understand East Asia to make more informed policy decisions uh, in, about that part of the world, recruiting and retaining a government workforce with the right linguistic and cultural skills is a national security imperative. But Asian anti-Asian bigotry coming from the very top of the United States government risks driving away those Americans the national security apparatus needs most right now. The Foreign Service Institute categorizes Cantonese, Mandarin, Japanese, Korean, and Arabic as some of the most difficult languages to learn for American diplomats. Recruiting and retaining those with native fluency in these languages uh, saves time and resources for the US government. To understand the value of a linguistically and culturally fluent expert group uh, to guide US national security making, one needs to look no further back than Iraq and Afghanistan wars. The absence of a diverse national security workforce likely contributed to miscalculations and blind spots. Had Middle East, East experts not been scorned and belittled by neoconservatives at the time, the ruinous Iraq war could perhaps have been avoided altogether. For Asian Americans, implicit bias has been a longstanding issue that is finally getting more attention, partly in reaction to what, we, uh, what I just talked about, this rising anti-Asian hate. For years, Asian American diplomats have struggled to get assignments to countries where their language skills would be most helpful because of fear of foreign influence. There are documented cases where Asian American diplomats face lingering distrust about their Americanness, which is devastating for diplomats whose job is to represent our country. Last month, Congressman Ted Liu, Joaquin Castro, Andy Kim, and Congresswoman Chrissy Houlihan introduced the Accountability and Assignment Restrictions Act in order to increase accountability and transparency by giving State Department uh, diplomats with assignment restriction access to an independent appeals process while establishing reporting requirements for the State Department, including disaggregating data about race and ethnicity of employees subject to those uh, restrictions. This is a tremendously important initiative that I think deserves bipartisan support in the House and the Senate. This past May, I wrote a second piece in the Responsible Statecraft about anti-Asian violence in order for, uh, to highlight a dangerous, fast-moving bill uh, in Congress uh, called the Strategic Competition Act in the Senate and the Eagle Act in the House. This was, keep in mind, about five months uh, into the Biden administration when some of us had expected, I think, somewhat of a more uh, cooled, <laughs> uh, less escalatory uh, rhetoric and policies about China from the White House. And while President Biden has been less overt uh, than uh, President Trump in scapegoating China for the US's COVID crisis, Biden has embraced the idea that China poses an existential threat to the United States. In this Responsible Statecraft article I just mentioned, my former colleague Rachel Esplin Odell and I explained how using overly broad terms like malign influence deliberately stokes fear and anxiety as means to intimidate Americans who want to have constructive engagements with China or other countries. 
such generalized and fear-based language, first adopted by the Trump administration officials and now uh, you know, uh, almost uh, legislated into law, uh, normalizes discourse about China that is very alarmist in nature and could exacerbate McCarthyist attacks against Asian Americans that, as I said, are becoming unfortunately more commonplace today. It also implicitly places any person of Chinese descent or anyone who has dealings with Chinese universities, businesses, associations, under suspicion of somehow being an agent of the Chinese government. Such efforts are government sanctioned ways to, as legal scholar Margaret Lewis writes, uh, criminalize China-ness. Making broad claims about the malign influence of the Chinese Communist Party could also result in failure to respond effectively to discrete problems and risks. This uh, generalized concept prompts a generalized response of fear-based rhetoric that is coupled with protectionist and anti-immigrant regulations that do little to counter real threats and instead cause significant collateral harm. Often the blanket bans and symbolic gestures against the CCP involved uh, in this strategy actually leaves Americans more vulnerable to privacy and national security risks due to their narrow politicized framing. To President Biden's credit, one of the first things that he has done since he was elected into uh, office was signing an executive order condemning anti-Asian violence. He has of course not used inflammatory uh, terms like China virus to describe uh, the, the virus. And he has rightfully called on Congress to pass laws to strengthen law enforcement and data tracking capacity of hate crimes. And, you know, I, again, all good things, but these are simply not enough given the size uh, of the problem at, at, at hand. In July, it's just a few months ago, <coughs> excuse me, I wrote a third article about this challenge, this time in Foreign Affairs Magazine. Russell Jung, uh, who is a professor of Asian American Studies at San Francisco State University and co-founder of Stop AAPI Hate, and I argued in this piece that without sustained action on the part of the Biden administration, this pandemic era spike in anti-Asian violence may only be maybe only uh, a beginning. Um, we recounted the long history of racial discrimination in the United States and periods of heightened geopolitical anxiety that produce these spikes in anti-Asian vitriol. Today, officials' inflation of the threat of China combined with extremist rhetoric has restarted this cycle and has caused segments of American society to now view Asians and Asian Americans as an enemy, regardless of their connections to the Chinese government. According to the Center for the Study of Hate and Extremism, anti-Asian hate crimes in 16 major US cities increased by 149% between 2019 and 2020. Anti-Asian racism in the United States has been part of the American experience, like I said, dating back at least to the 1850s, when the first Chinese laborers arrived looking for work uh, in the California gold fields. As the number of Chinese, American, uh, Chinese workers grew, however, so did anti-Chinese sentiments. In the 1870s, for example, the Working Men's Party captured seats in the California state legislature by, uh, with their rallying cry, the Chinese must go. White mobs went on to destroy and displace more than 300 Chinese settlements along the West Coast throughout the 19th century and early 20th centuries. Eventually, politicians responded to this racism with the Chinese Exclusion Act of 1882, a wholesale ban on Chinese immigration. This act marked the first time in American history that the government barred an entire racial group from entering the country. Decades later, during World War II, this uh, exacerbated uh, the anti-Asian discrimination. Uh, in 1942, President Roosevelt signed Executive Order 9066, authorizing the forcible incarceration of over 110,000 Japanese, including Japanese American citizens in 12 concentration camps across the United States. Deprived of their constitutional rights to due process, this community spent years behind bars and suffered more than $2 billion of property losses. As Congressman Doris Matsui, a Democratic member from California, noted during a congressional hearing in March, quote, 
Our government and many of its leaders advanced the myth that the Japanese American community was inherently our enemy, end quote. Japan's surrender in 1945 did not put an end to this climate of fear. During the early uh, years of the Cold War, the FBI targeted Chinese and Chinese American scientists and students, questioning their loyalty to the United States and hounding them out of positions related to national security in government and the private sector. The US government continues to rely on many of the same stereotypes, stereotypes and assumptions today. Over the past three decades, Washington has denied security clearances to military contractors because of their ties to China, banned Asian American diplomats from working on Chinese and Korean policy issues, and as part of the Justice Department's China initiative, accused Asian Americans of economic espionage based primarily on their ethnicity. Although directed to a different part of Asia, the global war on terror followed a similar discriminatory, uh, discriminatory uh, playbook. Post 9-11 Islamophobia had a devastating effect on Arabs, Muslims, and South Asian communities here in the United States. News organization docu organizations documented 645 biased incidents targeting Americans of South Asian or Middle Eastern descent in the first week following 9-11 alone. Anti-Muslim hate crimes surged 17 fold that same year. In all of these cases throughout American history, the government justified its discrimination in the name of national security or public health, making it very hard to debate the validity of evidence used in prosecutions, deportations, and administrative decisions. Exaggerated rhetoric that claims otherwise merely sows anxiety and mistrust among Americans and clouds the US government's ability to accurately assess China's limited threat. This inflated sense of danger has warped public opinion too. In March, for example, the Pew Research Center found that 53% of Republicans and Republican-leaning independents describe China as an enemy, up from 38% in 2020. Negative views about China among Democrats also grew substantially from 17% in 2018 to 38% in 2021. Stop AAPI Hate self-reporting database has uh, re uh, recorded over 9,000 hate crimes, uh, hate incidents reported between March and June of this year alone. So the overheated Cold War era sensibilities play a major role in demonizing Asian Americans by association. And we need to talk about these issues head on. So where do we go from here? I think for the US government, especially members of Congress, there needs to be more awareness that inflating the threat of China and racializing the pandemic has a direct impact on Asian American constituents and voters who they represent. They have to be more cautious when using terms like influence operations because, because they are way too broad. Uh, instead, any sort of those challenges should be disaggregated into distinct parts with distinct responses that are not so heavily politicized. I think cultural, scientific, educational, commercial exchanges between U.S. and Chinese universities, companies, organizations, state and local governments should be encouraged rather than ostracized. Also, I think instead of banning or avoiding, avoiding uh, such linkages, uh, due to the connections of Chinese counterparts to the PRC party state apparatus. American entities that engage in these activities should provide training and resources to their personnel and students to make them aware of potential intelligence and security risks and suggest ways to mitigate them. US federal government officials can provide American civil society and state and local governments with information that will help them in developing such training resources. I also think the role of the public is extremely important. Citizens and civic groups have to pay more attention to this trend of anti-Asian hate and really grapple with the root cause of this uh, phenomenon. Uh, new coalitions are beginning to emerge that shine light on the foreign policy routes to the current crisis. Government officials, including members of the Congressional Asian Pacific American Caucus, have become more vocal in, in calling out the jingoistic anti-China rhetoric and noting the peril that they pose to American society. For example, in June, Representative Judy Chu warned of the danger of, quote, spreading unfounded suspicions that paint all Chinese people as threats, unquote, and that uh, those things put innocent Chinese Americans at risk. 
within the intelligence community as well as the State Department, there's also, I think, growing awareness that outdated counterintelligence guidelines uh, and, and, and overly broad language used by diplomats are uh, unhelpful uh, and dangerous. Uh, and that we need to encourage more talented Asian Americans, including those with relatives in China, uh, to, to be able to, uh, to use their linguistic and cultural skills in public service. So I know I put a lot on the table um, and I'm out of time. So I will stop here and I uh, very much look forward to this discussion. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jessica, for those wide ranging remarks. They, they, they've definitely given us a lot of points to um, take up in discussion, but I really am happy to turn to Ying Chen at this moment for her comments, um, Ying. Thank you, thank you, Majari. Um, I agree with you. Thank you, Jessica. This is such a profound and thorough analysis of the history and the causes and the forms of anti-Asian discrimination uh, in the United States. Um, I think uh, there are several observations that you made, I think are particularly interesting and important. So I wanna just highlight a, a little bit of them. And before I uh, move on to my questions, um, I think there's this crucial observation that um, some of the most recent um, Biden administration issued uh, legislations and even acts that were well intended, but seem to have very limited impact. Um, as Jessica pointed out, if the root cause, which is this over-exaggeration of China as a threat to the United States um, at the administrative level and that, you know, on, uh, within the foreign policy uh, sphere uh, was not uh, sufficiently addressed. I think that was a really uh, important point for, for everyone to uh, be aware of. Um, Jessica also provided a very important perspective on the overall implications of the anti-Asia and also anti-China sentiment, uh, where she pointed out that uh, these tensions are creating not only domestic uncertainty and fear, um, you know, with all the random verbal and violent physical attacks on individuals, but it also has some global repercussions as well, especially in nowadays when we are desperately, uh, you know, in need of some very crucial cooperations among different countries to fight against climate change, to fight against uh, public health crisis like the current pandemic, maybe future pandemics. You know, in, in this uh, climate, um, actually, it's very important to have cooperation rather than, than tensions. I think this is something um, Jessica pointed out was very, very much in danger if, uh, if the current tension uh, still uh, goes on. And last but not least, I think uh, Jessica uh, mentions this, one of the uh, important solution uh, to the current uh, anti-Asian sentiment was to actually have the Biden administration to make more conscious effort to diversify the internal deliberations on the foreign policy on China and not to just get advice from uh, those extremely hostile ones that you know, tend to simplistically portray China as the imminent and ultimate threat. Uh, but then she pointed out the dilemma here, which is that this diversification of opinions um, at the top at, at administration level could be very difficult um, you know, when those who are linguistically and culturally more related to Asia and, it, and in China, to China in, in specific would be considered as un-American and would be considered as you know, non-patriotic, uh, non you know, their loyalties being questioned and all that. So I think this dilemma was really uh, crucial uh, um, for us to be aware of. So relating to all these, I think, really important observations, I have, I have some questions that I hope um, Jessica could maybe elaborate a little bit more. Um, the first one is that um, in academia, I think there is a debate uh, about whether to categorize China's current economic system as socialist or capitalist. Um, despite its ruling party calls themselves communists, there's actually um, a, a, a big debate on you know, the, the actual system, the nature of the system of the country. Um, however, this debate doesn't seem to be uh, prevalent uh, in the foreign policy making process in the United States, uh, as far as I know. Um, and seems like to still call China communist could easily trigger ideological resentment and, and hate and fear 
within the American society. Um, although we observe that the US capitalist class has been really taking advantage of the Chinese market and, and Chinese workers for decades and have been really benefiting from its economic transition, which is very much towards the capitalist uh, direction. Um, how do you see this lack of discussion of the categorization of Chinese ideology really influence the anti-China rhetoric today? And so in other words, is there a, a deliberate dismissal of the debate uh, just for the convenience of maybe triggering ideological resentment and fear within the American society that you, uh, mm -hmm. you, you would, might elaborate on? Sure, thank you, Professor Chen. Um, and thank you for starting us off with such a hard question. <laughs> <laughs> but um, it really does, uh, I, I think, uh, get to the crux of the matter in terms of, you know, what you described, you know, this ideological lens with which we are viewing China uh, in a very deliberate fashion in order to, to stoke fear and anxiety uh, uh, that will uh, very much likely lead to McCarthyist attacks against anyone who is deemed to be too close or, or too leaning, uh, you know, uh, toward China or in favor of a more constructive uh, relationship with China. So you're, you're absolutely right. I mean, I will say that, as you know better than I, I mean, the economic relationship between United States and China is, is unquestionably uh, extremely um, intertwined. Uh, and, you know, the post 70, uh, 70s era of engagement that we have seen between the two countries um, <clears throat> have really uh, kept peace uh, and also helped mint more millionaires and billionaires <laughs> in both countries than perhaps any other uh, you know, part of similar period in human history. So you're absolutely right that the economic uh, dimension uh, of, of, of the bilateral uh, relationship, as well as the, the, the complex picture of China and its economic uh, system, uh, you know, I think it is often ignored. Uh, in, in part because it sort of complicates this very simplistic uh, narrative that you and I are talking about, where uh, China is, you know, uh, deemed to be a threat, uh, basically a, an ideological opposite of the United States, uh, which makes any kind of cooperation, even on planetary challenges like climate change, incredibly difficult to reconcile. Um, and I think that is, uh, again, very much intentional. Um, and I think it, it is part of this narrative that we're seeing right now uh, in Washington, where uh, by framing China as an existential threat of America. We are by nature de defining this relationship as adversarial, one that will likely lead to war. And that is going to be hugely costly uh, and, and, and incredibly uh, damaging uh, to both countries and the global economy. So I can't think of a more short-sighted uh, uh, policy than you know, advocating for, for conflict between the, the world's two largest economies when so much is at stake. And so I, I do think, um, you know, as you said, uh, this issue uh, really is one that deserves more uh, careful scrutiny, not simplistic ideological, uh, you know, uh, declarations uh, and worst case assumptions about each other. Um, I do think that uh, this is something that, you know, uh, American uh, economic, uh, you know, scholars uh, like you and, and others in, in uh, academia really can help us uh, because um, one of the things that I've, I've learned uh, from my time in Congress is that much of the nuance and the analysis done by scholars and experts like you um, are not funneled and, and really um, you know, read and appreciated uh, by uh, policymakers who uh, you know, respond more to uh, immediate uh, crises and, 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 and you know, uh, issues that, that emerge. Um, and so they're not engaged in deep thinking, you know, they're not used to looking at uh, issues and problems through multiple, um, you know, uh, perspectives. And so this creates, I think, a perfect storm where we've basically concluded that China is our enemy. Uh, and we're just kind of reinforcing that narrative through self-serving, you know, evidence that support that rather than really critically examining uh, that, that uh, you know, assessment um, and, and making sure that we have more nuanced policies to uh, support a more constructive uh, relationship going forward. So I think this is really uh, the, the work that lies ahead. Thank you. Thank you for this answer. Yeah, I completely agree with you that um, lots of the more nuanced analysis was simply dismissed and this was really detrimental to a, a more um, clear understanding of the situation and to think about the possible solutions ahead. And relating to that, I'm also wondering whether you think um, there is a actually a class base for this anti-Asian sentiment to grow really in the United States. 
Um, uh, because as we can as we can see, you know, the, the entire globalization, the neoliberal regime, indeed, bring a lot of American working class people um, into really um, dismal situations. They lose their jobs, they lose their income, and at the same, they see their uh, industry, they see their factories being outsourced to global south. So they were really, uh, you know, in front of their very eyes, they were seeing their living situations getting more deteriorated while at the same time they see their global south counterparts seem to be benefiting from it right so i think that when trump was making this make make america great great again campaign it seems to resonate with some of the some of this uh, audience yeah so in that sense um what do you think in addition to maybe changing um, top leaders' um, narratives. What what other policies might also be really important to be in place to to in a way just you know um, um, uh, you know get, get rid of this 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 ground of of racist and xenophobic rhetoric from even growing in in this city in this society. Right, right. Yeah, that's another really uh, important question. I, I think you're you're absolutely right. There is no doubt that. You know, with globalization uh, and free trade agreements, and you know, the the uh, technology, of course, has played a, a huge role as well in um, you know uh, really reducing the the, the kinds of jobs uh, that the the middle America, the middle class, uh, the working class have enjoyed. Uh, and so, there's a great deal of anxiety about you know the place of American worker today. Um, and so, this I think uh, again is just part of this explosive combination that we're seeing, where we've had you know nearly a million American lives perished. Uh, we have this, uh, you know, racialized uh, language about China and COVID uh, that has been spoon fed to us um, for a better part of the year. Um, and, and this sense among, um, you know, Americans that um, our country is, is out of whack. You know, we, we're sort of, our, our priorities are, are, are not uh, where they need to be. Um, and I think, I mean, you didn't say this, but of course COVID has also, you know, shown in, in graphic ways how uh, the, the disparity uh, between the haves and have nots have, uh, are, are how, how stark that disparity really is. Um, and so you have, I think, definitely a class dimension to this anxiety that is building upon uh, Asian Americans. Um, you know, I will just turn to what President Biden said at the, said at the UN General Assembly. Um, <clears throat> you know, he said, uh, you know, the United States is not seeking uh, a new Cold War or a, or a world divided into rigid blocks. And I think that's a helpful rhetoric. Um, but you know, as we know, rhetoric is rhetoric. Policy and action is a completely different matter. Um, and so again, I think if we want to avoid this kind of uh, xenophobia and scapegoating that is, is has really emerged and solidified, uh, you know, among uh, some uh, you know Americans, uh, that we need to not just say that we're not uh, have uh, engaged in a cold war. We need to show through action uh, what that we're not. Um, and I have not seen much action. Uh, you know, the, there has not been lifting of tariffs uh, from the Trump era. Uh, there has not been, uh, you know, uh, re-engagement uh, of, of programs like Peace Corps and other things like that, that have helped to build, you know, people to people ties uh, and sustain them over the, the decades. So there's a lot that the Biden administration can do through action uh, to show that United States and China are actually vital partners uh, and that there are, that that no uh, issue, uh, including you know coronavirus, can really be resolved without some level of cooperation between uh, the two countries and the two governments. So I, I do think that showing those uh, positive dimensions, positive sum, uh, you know, narrative of the relationship, will greatly help uh, you know dispel this notion that Asian Americans are to blame, not just for the virus, but also, like you said, for this growing inequality. Thank you so much, Jessica. These are really thought-provoking answers. Yeah, um, so I'm turning the floor to Manjari and this is what I have. Thank you very much, Ying and Jessica. Um, no, I think this has been a fantastic discussion, especially because it takes this issue of anti-Asian racism, which has been in the news in our lives, um, in our classrooms. It's been a concern of our students um, and our teachers for a long time, but it really puts it in a much broader context, which you know, showing that there are historical underpinnings to this kind of xenophobia and racism 
Um, it's a it's a long standing strand in the American story, really. Uh, but also bringing in not just the historical context, the foreign policy context, I think is a very important piece. Um, and I think Ying, thanks to your comments, um, how there are these other dimensions of class and, and a kind of um, lopsided crude analysis in terms of understanding where China itself is in terms of the kind of economy it um, has. So I think in that sense, by providing this much richer nuanced context, I think it takes the discussion to a different place. Um, I do want to invite the audience to please put in your questions in the Q&A. Um, but in the meanwhile, I do want to bring up a question that's been posed by my co-director at the India China Institute, Mark Fraser. Um, he's asking, um, what role do you think social media platforms have played in exacerbating their anti-Asian hate incidents? At the same time, videos of these crimes posted on social media have raised awareness of the problem to the public and mainstream media. Um, would you propose any policies on social media regulation to prevent anti-Asian attacks? Um, and if I might just add a somewhat you know, difficult point to this thing about this question about social media that Mark is raising. I think it's through some of these videos, especially the most painful videos to watch of attacks on anti-Asians um, that you realize that very often these attacks um, are perpetrated from, you know, by other minority groups. And that's made it an especially fraught and difficult issue to discuss because it's almost as if they are victims of victims. Um, and it raises this challenge of how to create cultures and conversations of solidarity and how to create alliances um, rather than a, a more fractious um, culture. And I think the issues of class that Ying raised are absolutely paramount to trying to understand um, the more specific and targeted nature of these attacks. So, so yes, there's a big question on social media. Yeah. There's a question of um, 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 this kind of interracial tensions within American society. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you so much. I I, I uh, will try to um, share some insights. Although, as you alluded to, this is part of I think a much broader conversation that needs to be had about how. Uh, social media can provide a uh, platform for hate speech, um, and uh, you know, it, and 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 done in a way that you know is really hard to hold people accountable because you could be anonymous um, and you could do this fairly rapidly, very efficiently, really <laughs> than like going up to someone on, on the street. Um, so it's a very difficult issue. Um, you know, I will highlight that uh, the Network uh, Contagion Research Institute published a report last spring. Uh, that showed that there is increase in conspiratorial and hateful rhetoric against Asians as a result of the COVID-19 you know, language. Um, and, and this is being seen across social media platforms such as 4chan and Twitter. And it's unclear uh, whether you know, the social media companies are taking these issues seriously and what sort of things are being done to curb disinformation, misinformation, and hate speech against Asian Americans. Um, and so I, I do think, you know, that perhaps looking at, um, you know, ways in which U.S. Uh, law enforcement and, and uh, social media companies, uh, you know, dealt with anti-Muslim speech post 9-11 perhaps could be applied to the current situation. Of course, um, you know, there may not be a, a, a good parallel, uh, given that, you know, that's something that took place, of course, 20 years ago. And, and obviously there are many more uh, social media platforms now than before, um, you know, the 9-11 era, excuse me. So I, I think that this is something that really um, needs to be discussed. Um, as somebody who uses Twitter for work, I often see, um, <clears throat> you know, the ways in which trolls uh, attack uh, commentators, uh, accusing them of all kinds of things uh, with very little pushback. I mean, you could block them uh, and that, you know, kind of insulates you somewhat from being sort of, you know, on the front end of that kind of attack. Uh, but th there's nothing stopping them from promoting, you know, uh, misinformation about you and your work uh, and accusing you of being, you know, a sympathizer of X and apologist for Y, et cetera. So you can kind of quickly see how this could be incredibly damaging uh, to, to scholars and experts and, you know, people who uh, whose livelihood depends on 
you know, creating a balanced objective analysis. So I think from an, an, an analysis perspective, uh, platforms like Twitter definitely, I think, uh, don't do enough to sort of um, counter uh, those types of misinformation uh, that exist and, and can proliferate uh, very quickly and easily at a moment's notice. So I, I do think this is something that needs to be, um, you know, looked at very carefully. Um, you know, I expect many of the students that might be uh, watching this would you know also think about the platforms they're on including instagram and so forth and you know again each platform uh, i think provides a, a very um you know uh, almost irresistible <laughs> menu of options in terms of you know engaging in, in heated rhetoric uh and insinuating things with with very little repercussion i mean you could get away with a lot and so i think that's why like i said this report i mentioned is so vital because it's kind of connecting these online activities with um you know uh, key words uh, related to COVID, China, et cetera. And, and they're analyzing that there is a connection uh, and that um, there is a community that is really fostering uh, this very um, you know, toxic uh, narrative about Asian Americans and COVID. So I think those studies are important and, and should be highlighted as well. And I would love to see more in general, more conversations between Asian American groups and, and, and Asian American studies experts and political scientists with tech experts. Uh, because clearly there is, uh, you know, a nexus here that is not really being discussed, uh, where these ideas are growing and, and people are given a, a, a way to, to speak uh, uh, things that are not fact checked uh, at all. Um, so I think th this connection needs to be explored much more uh, fully. Yeah, thank you, Jessica. Um, there's a question from my colleague in the program in international affairs, Sakiko Fukudapar. Um, she is asking, could you comment on the rise of anti-China political rhetoric and the political context of rise in authoritarianism? Um, do you see it as a similar process at work as anti-Muslim policies of the BJP in India, or indeed the historical experience of scapegoating Jews for economic crisis? Yeah, that's a really good question as well. Um, <clears throat> I do think that there is some legitimate concerns among American policymakers about uh, the authoritarian tendencies of Xi Jinping uh, and, you know, what some describe of as, as a cult of personality, you know, this kind of like relentless uh, badgering and of a narrative that he is this benevolent force and everything is just hunky dory in China and America should mind its own business. And so um, I think that, uh, you know, those types of uh, authoritarian tendencies that exist, not just in China, but of course, in other countries too, uh, should be a concern for anyone who, you know, cares about, you know, democracy, uh, kind of uh, civil society and, and the ability of government to be, um, you know, more accountable uh, to the public. So I think China obviously it, it, it poses, uh, you know, a, a very uh, interesting uh, case study for that. Um, you know, in the United States too, of course, our uh, moral standing in, in terms of being able to speak on these issues eroded greatly uh, due to uh, what we saw, um, you know, in terms of uh, the transition of power between Trump and Biden and the January 6th insurrection uh, attempt uh, and other incidents like that where, you know, clearly uh, that was a very damaging uh, to, you know, this, um, <clears throat> uh, this uh, you know, narrative that we tell. Uh, uh, you know, of American exceptionalism and global leadership and, you know, how we're just, um, you know, police that, you know, will ensure some rule-based order, even when we ourselves break those rules. Um, and so, you know, I think there is a lot of contradictions there in terms of what we say uh, about other countries and what we criticize and what kind of standards we put, uh, you know, on other countries and what we do, you know, uh, when our systems fail. Um, and so I think that is uh, just a, a, a dose of reality that more American policymakers should uh, embrace uh, and be more humble uh, about. Uh, of course, um, there are some who will say, well, you know, why are you hating on America? America's great, you know, <laughs> like, don't criticize us. We're doing our best. At least we're not as bad as X or Y country. Um, but, you know, again, I think um, the past uh, few months uh, we have seen you know, uh, enough uh, to um, to cause uh, anxiety among uh, some of us who, uh, you know, are really shaken um, and, and worried that uh, United States will no longer credibly uh, 
uh, be able to advocate on, you know, uh, things like democracy and, and open governance and so forth, uh, because our house is, is in such disarray. So I think that's uh, one of the things that, you know, we argue um, in, in a paper that I wrote last January, you can access on our website, we lay out an East Asia strategy. And one of the things that we talk about is this idea that, you know, democracy promotion begins at home. Like it's, it's nice that we do that abroad, but let's also do some of that at home. Uh, we clearly need to, uh, to invest in ourselves before we tell other countries how to govern. So, I mean, this is, again, not your typical kind of thing that you might necessarily hear from folks in Washington, uh, because they are still very much vested in this very, you know, uh, uh, one-sided narrative about America's role. But there is, you know, I, I think no question that we would be the, the envy of the world if we were, you know, this kind of beacon uh, of democracy and, and you know, open uh, society uh, that we claim to be. So I think that connection really uh, it needs to be made. Um, and, and hopefully uh, it, it is uh, something that, you know, all Americans can agree on. I mean, unfortunately, as you know, uh, Washington is divided on so many issues uh, that even talking about this uh, could elicit, you know, um, you know, uh, accusation of being too partisan, um, you know, and so this is a huge problem because for a, a democracy to function, you need, you know, uh, both a government that is accountable to the public uh, and a government that is evolving and, and really in, uh, reforming itself um, to meet the, 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 you know, the needs of the time. Uh, rather than be just always defensive, you know, and and, and be stuck in this frame uh, of mind uh, about our role and and you know what we what we do. So I I, I hope we can have more honest uh, discussions uh, because that's you know I think it, again just the best way to model uh, for authoritarian countries abroad who are not allowing free speech, like you said at the top of this event, you know, and not allowing conversations like this because they're afraid. Uh, well, at least we have some of that going in the U.S. and that's great. Uh, but in addition to academic freedom and, and, you know, kind of, you know, the ability for, you know, um, people to kind of uh, raise these issues uh, openly, I think we need to do much more uh, to, you know, uh, to make sure that our democratic, uh, you know, practices, uh, uh, you know, are uh, something that, um, that, that still work. It's not just a myth we tell ourselves, it's actually real, uh, and that people feel like, you know, their votes count uh, and that they're being represented in these policies. And Jessica, I think those are really thoughtful remarks about how the domestic situation in the United States really shapes how we can speak about situations in other countries. And I should note that Sakiko actually clarified that she meant um, rise of US authoritarianism, uh, so authoritarianism within the United States. So I think you, you, without realizing it, actually mirrored her own concerns. And I think it does produce this particular challenge where on the one hand, we really want to push back against anti-Asian rhetoric um, in the United States. And on the other hand, still have the space of making critiques of what, um, you know, as scholars, as policy analysts, as politicians might see as authoritarian orientations within countries like China and India, which have definitely um, grown dramatically in the last few years. And so how to navigate that, to leave the space for critique and yet not let it escalate and descend into this crude racist hatred is I think a, a real tricky um, 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 challenge. Um, but I did want to bring another question to you um, also from Mark Fraser. He's saying, um, sorry, uh, okay. It's, so the question is every recent election in the United States, especially presidential elections, sees China as a target of attack by candidates from both parties. Are you worried about this resuming in 2022 congressional and 2024 presidential elections and leading to more violent incidents? And this is, I mean, this is absolutely true. If there's a one thing that brings this polarized Washington, but really extremely polarized country and the echo chambers that we all live in within social media, but also in our dinner tables um, is this common hatred and attack on China and, um, yeah, that's, that's that's a great question. I think about that a lot uh, because you know I, I am not um, you know so I'm not that optimistic. Uh, I mean I'm opt I'm an optimistic person generally, but I'm not that optimistic that you know this is something that was just a blip uh, 
uh, and that, you know, in the midterm election and the next presidential, things will just be like sort of more sane and <laughs> less heated uh, in terms of uh, describing China's threat to the United States. Um, <clears throat> so it's, it's a difficult uh, issue. I mean, I think, you know, one of the saddest things that I've realized in writing, you know, these articles was, you know, I thought that we had somehow closed that chapter after, uh, you know, the Trump uh, administration, um, you know, transitioned um, after Trump left. Um, and I, I think some of us just naively thought that because again, the, the language he used was just so overt and public and in your face. Like it was just kind of hard not to like see what he was doing. Um, so I think from sort of, you know, uh, that perspective, uh, thinking that we had closed that chapter, you know, I, I, I now see was I was just wrong. Uh, that, that was not the case at all. Um, in fact, a lot of the, 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 the Trump era policies with, with respect to China, as I said uh, before, are being continued uh, in, under the Biden administration. Um, so what does that mean? Uh, and, and, you know, keep in mind, too, I think the uh, Mark is also alluding to the fact that, you know, as members of Congress run for re-election, you know, next year in the midterm, uh, and of course, as Biden thinks about, you know, uh, his uh, re-election prospects, um, there, unfortunately, is very little room right now in Washington for folks to say the things that I'm saying, because they feel like it will make them seem weak against China, and that it will become a liability in elections. Um, even if they believe it, you know, even if they're told by like the Chamber of Commerce and universities and whatever, you know, name your stakeholder who actually thinks a re reasonable relationship is in U.S.'s interest. I mean, they, even if they believe that, you know, at the end of the day, they're they feel like politically they're unable to articulate that uh, for fear of, uh, again, just, you know, losing power. Um, <clears throat> So how do we overcome that? Um, you know, I think one way, like I said, is for the public to just own this issue. Um, it's something I didn't really personally going into it wanted to speak on because as you can imagine, it's not really great feeling to be like Asian American being like, hey, let's talk about Asian American racism. Um, nor do I want to insinuate that like white colleagues who talk about China are somehow racist. I mean, so you have to be really careful when you talk about this issue in general. And it's also very something I obviously feel passionately about because I'm Asian American. So like, it's just a hard issue to begin with, I think, for people to talk about. But we must talk about it because the situation is so grave. Um, not only do we need to talk about it, we need to give platforms like this and, and more experts like you all a chance to like make these cases in not, not just in your paper, you know, citywide paper, but, you know, national newspapers and, and just like continue to you know, feed the content about what is happening uh, to the Asian American community uh, and, and, you know, how this uh, very toxic discourse in Washington is, is feeding uh, this anxiety very much directly. So I think all of that needs to happen. And I, I guess the other thing to mention too is that it, <clears throat> I think there is, uh, you know, a, a real concerted effort. Certainly, this is a, a very high priority at the Quincy Institute in terms of not just providing good analysis, you know, but also, like I said, bringing the, 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 the stakeholders and, and civic communities and NGOs uh, involved. So on any given day, my work on China and, and, and this issue will involve not just China experts, um, but also um, anti-war uh, groups or uh, veterans groups or, um, you know, climate change uh, NGOs. So really bringing diverse stakeholders and really having them think and, and getting them to understand that not only is US-China cooperation good for their issue, it also has this domestic civil liberties, um, you know, uh, component to it. Uh, and that, um, you know, th this is all part of a very uh, virtuous cycle, right? Because the more we make improvements in the bilateral relationship, hopefully uh, these kinds of uh, language will uh, become less and less acceptable to the public. Um, so I think this is a whole host of things that have to come together. Um, and I hope more people are, are um, you know, recognizing that. I mean, fi final thing I'll say about this is that I've been very, um, you know, uh, encouraged to see like emergence of new groups like the Asian American Foundation, for example, that is, you know, trying to raise money to fund more activities uh, that raise awareness on this issue. Uh, and I think that's fantastic. Um, <clears throat> I, I think what is missing, though, is, you know, we're seeing a lot of 501c3 nonprofit activities that do a lot of education. And, you know, uh, you know, uh, again, I think that's hugely important. 
because uh, we need funding to help these organizations do the work. So that's what foundations like TAP is doing, which is great. But I think the, 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 the problem we're seeing is that the Asian American community doesn't have enough political power to really you know, become an electoral force uh, so that you know, politicians stop using China as a boogeyman and, and you know, uh, throw the China line in virtually every sentence you know, uh, about you know, what, what their priority is. So you know, we need to uh, be more cognizant of how politics and power works. You know, um, I think there is a role again for nonprofits, academics, think tanks, everyone to play. I'm not dismissing their importance whatsoever. But this huge elephant in the room is that we are uh, not seen as a politically potent community. And that's why, uh, you know, using us as a scapegoat is so easy um, and it's uh, undeniably going to continue. So I think understanding the political dy dynamic is gonna be really key. And I think there are members of Congress and folks on the political organizing side who get that, uh, but they um, are, I think, um, uh, you know, by and large, not that unified as a, as a you know, community. Uh, because as you know, Asian Americans, we, we have like all of these subgroups like Korean Americans, Chinese Americans, Vietnamese, you know, and I was part of one of them, Korean Americans. I, I, so I have no beef against that, but it, it just makes it all the more difficult to then kind of like create this like pan-Asian, you know, uh, network. Um, but unless we talk about that political dimension, you are not going to really stop the members of Congress and elected officials, um, you know, um, effectively. Um, and so I think uh, that is a dimension that, you know, more people need to explore as well. Yeah, thank you, Jessica. Um, so, I mean, in some ways, that, so there are a couple of more questions from the audience that I want to bring to you. And in some ways, your most recent remarks um, speak to one of the questions from Anonymous. Um, and he or she is asking, says, isn't there a danger of making arguments against anti-Asian racism that are principally instrumental? And so they refer to, say, your first part of the talk talks about how um, the anti-China rhetoric is dangerous in part because it might turn away native speakers whose expertise in foreign policy is crucial um, and it makes for global policy on issues like climate change, et cetera, fraught when what we need is cooperation. And they say that while this is definitely important, um, I'm from Myanmar, if tomorrow there, was, there were racist attacks against people from Myanmar, none of these consequentialist arguments would hold true because we are not geopolitically nor economically particularly salient to the United States. And yet we need to make a strong case against these kinds of racist rhetoric and attacks. So shouldn't we making, instead of political instrumental consequentialist arguments, first and foremost, very strong principle arguments about a change in culture in American society? Yeah, I mean, I think that's exactly right. I mean, I have uh, always emphasize that when I talk about diversity in national security workforce, I'm not so much as interested in seeing more people who look like me hold exactly the same view, <laughs> you know, the mainstream view. I want people with more diverse lived experience who are willing to challenge and buck the establishment's views on so many of these issues. What we have right now is groupthink. So, you know, you have a lot of people who hold the same views uh, in very high positions in, in government. Uh, I'm not saying that having a more diverse, uh, you know, uh, workforce is the only way to avoid all of these, uh, you know, things that we're seeing today. But I do think it's it really important because unless you have that, you're not going to actually have real debate. Everyone's already in agreement. That's how you got into the room. Um, so, you know, on issues like U.S.-China relations that are so complex, um, there is no way you can have a group think on all the various dimensions of that bilateral relationship. It's just simply too, too vast. Um, you might have one view about US-China you know, tech relationship, um, you know, the legitimate concerns of like economic espionage, et cetera. Then you ha might have another view about US-China people-to-people ties, uh, et cetera. So you need people who can bring different perspectives you know, to the table, and I worry uh, that that is not happening, or it's uh, in some cases, people with ethnic or racial diversity, again, are being used as sort of as, as tokens to say, look, we have diversity. Like, are you happy? We have all these women now, and we have all these minorities now, so we're good, right? And it's like, well, are you actually having a debate on these issues or did you just bring in people who all agree with you 
uh, who, you know, who's not going to challenge you. So uh, these are two very different things. And I think we need to stop being reflexive and defensive about these things and actually uh, just have more real, honest discussions. Uh, and that is only going to happen when you have more people of diverse uh, perspectives. Uh, you know, some of these people have lived abroad, some of them have not. It doesn't quite matter, you know, the skin tone or whatever. As long as you can think and be constructive and be critical, uh, I think that is what is needed to uh, to have real substantive discussions uh, that we need right now. Thank you, Jessica. So I know we are making you talk a lot, and so maybe we'll we'll uh, uh, you know wrap up. But I did want to soon sooner rather than later, but I did want to bring to you one other question from the audience where um, they ask on the term influence operations, which you pointed out was dangerous in provoking suspicions and attacks. What do you think about the case of Australia and elsewhere where there has been, docu there has been documented a pretty extensive set of attempts by the CCP to influence politicians, media, businesses, and what some have called sharp power? How do we expose CCP influences while not triggering scapegoating rhetoric and behavior against innocent Chinese Australians, Chinese Americans, et cetera? Yeah, that's a really good question. I mean, obviously, like I alluded to just now with cases of espionage, I mean, there are actual real uh, counterintelligence issues and, and things that you know uh, we need to be mindful of. There's no doubt about it. Um, I think where, uh, as the questioner recognized, we uh, are, uh, you know, uh, risking um, where, where this becomes a problem is when these discrete case by case issues become, you know, this overblown. Like, well, of course, this is always going to be the case. Why do we even bother looking at these things in great detail? We know what the Chinese are up to. Uh, so I think there's a big difference uh, between, like I said, uh, observing and and and, um, you know. Uh, 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 sort of dealing with, with cases, whether it's in Australia or China or United States, uh, you know, through, uh, you know, gathering of evidence and through, you know, a process uh, that makes sense rather than, you know, assuming uh, that that people are already sort of connected uh, in this kind of nefarious, you know, all uh, kind of encompassing uh, network, uh, you know, of the CCP. So I think those are two very different things. Um, I worry that uh, you know, uh, again, uh, these are mostly politicians in Congress who talk about China in very sweeping terms. I think they think that they can sort of get away with it, that it's like kind of cost free. It makes them look tough. It makes them look kind of like tough on national security. And, you know, there's very little pushback. So they're like, yeah, let's just do this. Let's go after China. And I, I again, like really worry uh, because this is actually um, this doesn't really just affect Asian Americans. It actually also it impedes our ability to effectively address real real threats because when you politicize issues to that simplistic lens you you stop seeing other signs and cues uh, that might exist um, and so i think in that uh, way as well uh, we need to stop making sweeping claims and using overly broad terms like info ops to uh, to to make uh, assumptions about people or or their t uh, connections Thank you, Jessica. Um, um, you know, I think maybe we should wrap up, but I'm curious because we have you with us. I can't resist asking this question because in many ways, your, your core expertise is as a foreign affairs analyst in, in, in the Korean Peninsula. Um, so I'm curious to hear from you what you see as um, risks and opportunities ahead in Northeast Asia, um, the Korean Peninsula, Taiwan, um, especially given that we have this new Biden administration at the helm now. And uh, maybe this will be our last question. Sure. Was the question about the Korean Peninsula policy or Taiwan? Sorry, mm -hmm. I was changing my uh, mind. So maybe both, maybe both. I'm just curious to hear your views as to what you see as the big risks and challenges um, in the next few years um, in Northeast Asia. So that would include Korea sure. and would include Taiwan. Yeah, sorry, I was just taking my headphones off. Uh, uh, I was like hearing myself. So, <laughs> but anyway, um, yes, I, I think that um, you know we are. I mean, Northeast Asia and Asia more broadly has 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 undergone such epical changes uh, in in recent years. Um, I think it's really important for American policymakers who work on Asia to 
uh, grapple with that and, and to really ask uh, some fundamental questions about US's long-term strategy in the region. Um, obviously, we have many uh, treaty alliances and defense relations with countries like uh, South Korea. And many of the issues that are plaguing the region are not new, including North Korea's growing nuclear threat. Um, but at the same time, you know, taking a, it, we also need to stop uh, viewing the region through um, outdated kind of lens. Uh, and I see this happening uh, to a certain degree uh, in Washington, uh, which is why I'm bringing it up. I, I do see tendencies uh, among um, lawmakers uh, in particular who you know uh, still view the region through this kind of you know uh, post Cold War unipolar moment kind of you know narrative where you know we're the sole power you know we tell countries what to do including in Asia um, and you know the truth of the matter is the the region is is much more conducive to a multipolar environment uh, where multiple powers including China um, you know uh, have to contend and and you know really negotiate uh, to. Uh, to, to have good relations and to advance their interests. Uh, and so I, I, I think that is going to be a major problem. Um, you know, even talking about Korean Peninsula issues, it's very difficult in Washington in the sense that, you know, anytime you ask questions like, well, what, how long is the United States planning to stay in South Korea? I mean, this is, you know, it just kind of like blows people's minds in a way because like people are not talking about this. You know, they just assume, you know, US, is, US will be there indefinitely. Um, well, what about a, a long-term US strategy that actually in, uh, empowers countries like South Korea and Japan to take more ownership of their defense? You know, again, like just people sort of lose their minds <laughs> and it's like not, you know, not really appropriate uh, when you, when you're, I mean, I'm, now I'll be very serious, but I was just uh, talking in jest, but that's really not an appropriate response to such a, a, a commonsensical question, right? I mean, this is something American taxpayers should know. Uh, why do we have 29,000 US troops in South Korea? To what end? Why, when will be the time when there will be less needed? And instead of also fixating on troop numbers, why not talk about what, what the US strategy and long-term vision is? You know, um, and these are the types of things that we're asking at the Quincy Institute, and I think there is a receptivity to that, because I think for a long time we have just been used to, um, you know, the current model as being the one and only, and no, there was no questions asked. This was like, this was the best we got, and, you know, it, there's no discussions. Uh, yet the reality is that with such changes in the region that are taking place, and I think, frankly, um, you know, the, the competence that so many of these countries in the region have shown in recent years, including with the COVID pandemic, uh, I think it really begs the question of like, why don't these countries do more? You know, why do they need to be checking in with Washington, uh, you know, on so many, um, you know, of, of their vital, um, you know, interests like self-defense. Um, so I, I hope we can see more of that. Um, it is going to be a long process. And it is a paradigm shift in some ways in terms of, you know, viewing U.S.'s role not less as a dominant primacy kind of, you know, centric, you know, power, but more as as, as one of many powers, you know. Um, and so this is going to take a long time, uh, but I, I do think we're making progress and, and you know, certainly uh, would love to uh, interact more with, with folks like you who uh, hopefully can help us reach a broader audience, uh, because I do think once you leave the Beltway and, and talk to real Americans, these kinds of things don't seem so controversial. Uh, and I think now more than ever, Americans do want US government that is thinking more about domestic revival and, and you know, uh, saving costs when necessary. Um, you know, we don't need to spend a nearly trillion dollars a year in defense uh, and, and not be able to vaccinate Americans and give, you know, homes to homeless people. I mean, this is just common sense stuff. Um, so US government has to, I think at some, at some point, contend with that. Um, and, and ask these questions um, and uh, hopefully uh, course correct. I mean, no one is uh, saying anything that, you know, I think uh, is, is sort of like dramatic, right? We don't need to be, you know, sort of unpredictable and unilateral in some of these things. But in things like talking about US force posture in Asia, we can be deliberate, we can be long-term, we can be thoughtful, we can be consultative and still get to a place where, you know, um, uh, American, um, you know, uh, foreign policy is not so military based, but more, you know, uh, embedded in, in the economic and trade uh, dimensions, as well as, you know, through our diplomats, which is how most countries in the world, you know, um, project power.
Yeah. Jessica, I actually think that's a really profound and visionary note to end on this idea of a need for a paradigm shift in how America should think about its role in the world where it might actually require the United States also in part to learn from what other countries' experiences, histories, and competences have been. And that, that um, um, I think, is a much needed and profound shift where we go from having a single superpower to being one of many important um, forces in the world. So, so I think there couldn't be actually a better note on which to end today's session. Thank you very much. Um, um, for joining us today for this conversation. I would also like to thank Professor Ying Chen for her um, contributions to today's conversation. Um, I would like to thank my co-director at India China Institute, Mark Fraser, Grace Hu and the team at ICI, um, and especially Michael Evans at IT at New School who always ensures that things work seamlessly behind the scenes. Um, thank you to all of you in the audience who have joined us from different corners of the world. Um, please do join us for our next event, which will be a panel discussion on the ecological question in global health, which will include speakers from India, China, Singapore, and elsewhere. It will take place on November 18th, which is also a Thursday at 9 a.m. So till then, um, goodbye and thank you. Thank you. Bye. You, bye.